Oh, nothing less than victory. Decisive wars and the lessons of history from Princeton in year 2010. And soon I hope to be out on a paperback. This, the genesis of this book started from a course I was teaching on warfare, ancient and modern. I was very interested in finding out whether I could see common themes from battles from the ancient period and how they would connect to the modern period. Is there something the same about World War II, let's say, and the uh, attack of the Persians against the Greeks? And obviously, if you want to talk about technology, the way they fought the wars, that there's not a lot in common. You're not going to learn a lot about how to arrange, you know, a German Panzer tanks by looking at how they arranged a, a line of spear throwers in ancient Greece. But what I found we could learn a lot about is the basic motivations for war. Why do people fight? Why do wars start? And of course, there's a huge, huge range of causes for this, many, many causes, very complex. Nothing Less Than Victory focuses on one main cause, which is the human decision to fight. Wars start because human beings decide to fight, and that simple truth often gets forgotten. The decision to fight may start with a political decision by the government, but it never ends there. It can end there, because in one case, a government may, might, may make such a decision, and the people may rise up and overthrow them and get a better government. In other cases, such as Hitler's Germany, they may willingly go along. Even if they, you ask them on the street, do you want war? They might say no, but the Fuhrer orders them to go, and they go. And so nothing less than victory then takes as its theme the decision to fight and shows how the decision to fight is played out in seven examples from history that stretch from ancient Greece into the 20th century. Well, let me give you one to start with in uh, 490 and then 480 BC, almost 2,500 years ago, the ancient Persians attacked Greece. The basic story that people know is that they attacked once by sea in 490 BC and then attacked again by land in 480 BC and were beaten. What people may not realize is that the attacks of the Persians on the Greeks went on for decades before that time. And in fact, the Greeks had to spend decades after that time driving them out of the Aegean Sea. So the basic question at hand would be, why does Xerxes, the Persian king, marching with perhaps a half a million men into Greece um, with overwhelming forces, no one could stand in his way, suddenly face a reversal that happens literally in one afternoon and ends up running back for his life? And why, even more importantly, is that an end to all Persian attacks on the Greeks? From that point on, the Persians never again attack mainland Greece. And Nothing Less Than Victory explores that and comes up with how it was that the magnificent victory of the, of the Greeks forced a change in policy of the Persian king. It's an exciting story and a, a, uh, a story that is relevant for all time. Ancient Sparta was known as the most powerful land army in ancient Greece. In 20, 27 years of warfare, near the end of the 5th century, ancient Athens, the strongest naval power in Greece, was unable to defeat Sparta. Yet 30, just over 30 years after the end of that war, an army of farmers from northern Greece marched into Spartan territory, drove the Spartans back to their own city, and ended generations of slavery in southern Greece. How did they do it? How was it? You see the parallel to uh, Persia, right? What's important about Persia was that the, their defeat, the victory of the Greeks, forced a change in policy such that the Persians never attacked again. Once these Spartans again going ahead a century and a half, once they were driven back, they never again were able to attack northern Greece. Why? Why were these wars so decisive? Why was there a change in their ability to make war and indeed their desire to make war? I can give you another uh, example of a battle if you like. The same thing happened in the Second Punic War between Carthage and Rome. You push ahead about a century now, you're into the 200s BC, and Carthage, ancient Carthage on the coast of North Africa, and Rome were involved in three major wars. The uh, 
one that I deal with is the Second Punic War. The First Punic War had ended with only the First Punic War had ended with an indecisive victory over Carthage, in which Carthage was back again fighting again almost exactly 20 years later. Sounds almost exactly like the defeat of the defeat of the Germans in World War I, which was an incomplete victory, and the Germans were back fighting again, attacking almost exactly 20 years later again. Well, going back to Rome and Carthage, the Second Punic War began when that war ended. There was a decisive victory over the Carthaginians, and they reversed their policy, never again attacked Rome, accepted their position as a peaceful trading empire, and basically the wars between Carthage and Rome ended. The Third Punic War, which happened some 50 years later, was a terrible, terrible mistake by the Romans, resulted in the destruction of Carthage, which I see not as a point of honor or success by the Romans, but a point of shame and something that never should have happened. So again, in each case, the question at hand is the uh, decisiveness of the victory. Well, let's, uh, let's go ahead to the modern day. I do seven in general. I'll skip by another one in Rome, by which the Roman Emperor Aurelian was able to reverse uh, a division of the Roman Empire into thirds, and it was able to reunite the empire in, within a period of three years in a way that successors over 30 years before were unable to do. And I move ahead to the American Civil War. I have the audacity to think that I can actually study the American Civil War and come up with the same uh, kind of questions about why it was the war ended so decisively and what it took to win it. And the decisive event, in my view, was Sherman's march through the South. Contrary to um, received opinion, Sherman was not a voracious marauder killing people. We know he actually didn't kill civilians at all as long as they didn't shoot at him or weren't in the line of fire and uh, uh, went through the South and destroyed property in order to make the defeat of the South real to the Southerners. If proof is in the success, then let us ponder the fact that the end of the Civil War marks the last war, to date at least, fought uh, between Americans and uh, thus is a magnificent success for Grant and Sherman and for Lincoln. And again, it was the decisiveness of the defeat of the South and the decisiveness of the success of the North and the magnanimous peace terms afterwards, which did not try to enslave, re-enslave the South, but rather admitted them back into the Union that made it all possible. So let's talk a little bit about what I, what I, uh, my approach to World War II in Europe. Contrary to the other battles, to the other uh, wars that I deal with, I don't really deal with the fighting of World War II at all. Um, and considering the decision to fight and why it was that the continent went up in flames again for the second time in 20 years, I deal with the lead up to World War II and specifically the British appeasement of Hitler. Now, appeasement was a failed policy and it's been known as a failed policy attached to the name of Neville Chamberlain, the Prime Minister. But in fact, appeasement was a long-standing British policy. It worked in a sense when you weren't appeasing the basic principles, when you were dealing with someone who shared your principles and you appease over minor issues or optional issues. It's a very valid way of going ahead. But to appease on basic issues, to take a man such as Hitler, right, who the uh, British knew by the late 1930s was uh, uh, rounding up Jews. I mean, developed a created a police state, right? Uh, was uh, was not the way. Priestman was not the way that should have been used. And what I show is that the reasons why the British appeased Hitler, they appeased Hitler because they accepted basic moral ideas that Hitler used against them. The British accepted, for example, just to name one of them read the book for the rest, the name one of them, that every nation should have a right to national self-determination. Therefore, the Germans have a right to determine their own destiny. Well, then when Hitler said, what about the Sudetenland Czechs? What about the German speakers in the Southland of Czechoslovakia? Well, okay, the British were unable to oppose that and say, no, they don't have a right to determine themselves, not if it means becoming the dominant race. 
And so Hitler was able to use this moral idea against the British to disarm them in a way that the British actually became, and they never intended this, but they became in fact Hitler's allies and allowing Hitler to achieve his goals. There's a very powerful lesson in this. Powerful lesson in this. Now for World War II in the Pacific then, I deal with the American defeat of Japan. And now again, we're back to actual fighting. We're back to actual political decision making. And we're back to how it was that the intransigent Japanese desire for war and their complete unwillingness to surrender was reversed so quickly. It's little forgotten, uh, little remembered, I should say, by uh, many people that the day the Nagasaki atomic bomb was dropped, the second atomic bomb, the Japanese had still refused to surrender. It was only when the emperor came forth and said, I cannot subject my people to more such carnage that the decision to surrender was given. And for those who think that the, that the defeat of Japan was something bad or something horrible, it is certainly horrific to drop bombs on people, especially atomic bombs. But look at what happened in the aftermath. Japan has given up completely, thoroughly, more than any nation perhaps in history, all of its desire for expansive, aggressive war and has become a wonderful friend of the United States, a land in comparison to the rest of the world of freedom and uh, uh, simply a wonderful place to be and a wonderful people to know. And this happened because they had to be told and shown that their militaristic desire for uh, empire through aggressive war uh, was defeated. And that is, that is what I show in this book. Excellent. And where's your book available? My book is available on Amazon.com from Princeton in uh, 2010. And they're telling me that uh, by next year, 2012, there should be a paperback edition out. I hope so.